Good day. I want to talk to you today on part two of the series of Nissan 10, which of course is Palm Sunday, to Nissan 14, which is Passover, Pesach. And I want to give some insights, if I may, that you may have not seen previously. So let me delve right into it. I'm going to show my PowerPoint. And here on the PowerPoint, I'm going to first show you that there are... Uh, let me do it. Uh, we were taking it from Leviticus 23, and there the definition of all of the feasts. You can see them on the screen in a, uh, on the here, where you see the three on the left: a Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, Jesus coming the first time, and then the trumpets, day, day of atonement, uh, tabernacles coming the second time, and of course the giving of the Spirit on um, Pentecost. But today I want to look at the spring feasts, and the spring feasts I want to talk about Passover. Passover, by definition, in Leviticus 23, begins on Nisan 14, and it's a day of coronation of kings. This is a very important one to remember for later on in the presentation. And, of course, then we have unleavened bread. That's on the next day following Nisan 14. That would be Nisan 15, seven-day feast. First and the last day are high Sabbaths. Please remember that a high Sabbath, the first and the last day, you would see that it is also important. First fruits. The first fruits are the day following the weekly Sabbath. So in that eight-day period, from Passover to the end of Unleavened Bread, there is a Shabbat, a Sabbath. And the day following that is the definition of first fruits. Now, just for clarification, modern-day uh, rabbinical teaching is is that uh, first fruits falls on the day after the beginning of unleavened bread for just simply uh, the sim uh, making it flow th freely and so they put first fruits on the 16th of Nisan for just for practice uh, for uh, convenience sake so here's Passover and uh, we're looking at the Passover lamb but Again, remember, Passover begins on the evening, in the evening. And so here we see what happened on the evening uh, for Jesus, on the time of Jesus. Well, we know that he was in the Olive Garden, uh, the Mount uh, Gethsemane, if you will. And Gethsemane means oil press. Very important to remember. And it says this in Luke 22, 41 to 42. And Jesus was withdrawn from uh, them about a stone's throw. And he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if it is your will to take this cup away from me, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. So we see here that Jesus is facing something. He's being pressed in Gethsemane, in the oil press itself. And there he was crying out to the Father and being in agony. He was in agony. Jesus prayed more earnestly. Then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Now we know from a physiological point of view that great drops of blood can come out of the uh, from the capillaries of our skin and uh, when we're under great duress, great pressures, great psychological pressure and mental pressure and Jesus was in that position and he desired so much to be released but he also knew it was uh, the Father's will and he gave in to the Father's will and of course uh, the, the soldiers came and they Jesus was betrayed by Judas and he betrayed him with a kiss. And then they took Jesus away. And now Jesus was about to face a series of trials. And he was going to, they took him to Annas. These were the soldiers, not the Roman soldiers. These were the Jewish soldiers. They took him to Annas first, who wasn't the high priest, but he was the father of the high priest. He was the father-in-law of the high priest Caiaphas. And they did it in honor of him, most likely. And then they took him to Caiaphas following Annas. Then they put him before the Sanhedrin, uh, which was the leadership of the Jewish people, the 70 that were placed in leadership. And then we, he was taken to Pontius Pilate. Then he was taken to Herod. Then he was taken back to Pontius Pilate. And then he was crucified. Now all of these uh, trials, there were three Jewish trials. There were three Roman trials, if you will. He was before the Sanhedrin. 
all of them were illegal. All of them did not meet the criteria, but this is the process they took him through. And in Luke 22, 20, 22, we read, as soon as it was day, the elders of the people, both chief priests and scribes, came together and led him into their council, saying, if you are the Christ, tell us. But he said to them, if I tell you, you will by no means believe. And if I also ask you, you will by no means answer me or let me go. Hereafter, the Son of Man will sit on the right hand of the power of God. What a statement by Jesus. Then they all said, Are you then the Son of God? And Jesus said to them, You rightly say that I am. Now this is an amazing statement. Many of us could miss this one. When he says, I am, he is actually declaring that he is God. Remember Moses, Moses met uh, the Lord, Yahweh, uh, at the burning bush. Do you remember that time? And Moses was saying, who do you say, who should I say that sent me? And the Lord replied, I am that I am. And then he went on and further saying, when they ask you, <coughs> say, I am sent you. So Jesus is here, is again saying, I am. And they said immediately, they recognized what he was seeing. They recognized what he declared. And they say, blasphemy. That's what Jesus died of, or not was accused of. That was the crime that they called against him and called for his death. It was blasphemy. And then they had said, you heard him. There's no more for, uh, for witnesses. And so they were to take him and they beat him, which was illegal, of course. And then after they finished uh, their witnessing, and they brought him to Pilate. And they brought him before Pilate. Pilate was the governor of Judea, the highest authority in that part of the land. And Pilate therefore said to Jesus, Are you a king then? And Jesus answered and said, You say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world. What a statement. Did you see that? He says, For this cause I was born, to be a king. For this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. And of course, Pilate then looked at Jesus and he said those amazing words, what is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and he said to them, I find no fault in him at all. Now this is very, very important to remember this phrase. I find no fault in him at all. It comes up three times. When anything is said three times, that means it's shouting out. It's screaming out at us to listen. And so again, I find no fault in him. And then Pilate was wanting really to find a way to release Jesus. So he used one of the laws, the existing laws, and that was for the, that Passover season, and they could release a criminal And at that time. So he brought out one. He says, which of these two men would you have me release to you? And he brings forth a murderer, Barabbas, who was a notorious violent maniac. And they said, or Jesus called the Messiah. Now, I really believe that Pilate thought they would release Jesus, but they didn't. They called for the release of Barabbas. And his name, by the way, was Jesus Barabbas. And we have Jesus of Nazareth. And Pilate was concerned. He was concerned because he what he had to do. So he made the decision to take Jesus and have him uh, whipped, to have him beaten, to have him lashed. And we see in the, from the various scenes that there was a horrific horrific amount of punishment and then they put a crown of thorns on his head put a robe on him they mocked him and Pilate then went out again and said to them now he did he went out to a, he went out alone to the remember the Caiaphas and the, the the priests it was just a small number of them it's not a lot of people this was at night it was hidden just the leadership were gathered with Caiaphas and he, he came out to them and he said, Behold, I'm bringing him out to you that you may know that, here it is, I find no fault in him. And then they, he brought Jesus out. He, <clears throat> he declared that to the people. He brought Jesus out and Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. 
And Pilate said to him, them, Behold the man. Therefore, when the chief priests and the officers saw them, they cried out, saying, Crucify him! Crucify him! And Pilate said to them, You take him and crucify him. Here it is again. For I find no fault in him. Wow, wow, wee, woe. And then the leadership cried out, Crucify him! Crucify him! And Pilate felt under great pressure to go forth and do so. Now, I just want to stop, stop for a second and think about a couple of things we just said. One of the things, the crown of thorns that went around his head. And it said, Pilate took Jesus and scourged him, and the soldiers twisted a crown of thorns. Now, a crown would be looking at kingship, but this is a crown of thorns. It's still a crown. They put it on his head and they put it a purple robe. Purple robe is always a sign of royalty. So now we're just, he a, has a crown, purple robe. We're looking at kingship. And then they said, hail to the king of the Jews. And they struck him with their hands. You might say, yes, but this was all in mockery. Yes, but it meant the legal requirement of naming and calling forth that he was king, even though it was done in mockery. And so Jesus was the king. Now, what day was this? This is important. What day was this? You say, uh, Passover, yes. Which day on Nisan? Nisan 14. And which day was Nisan 14? The coronation of kings. Jesus was actually coronated. Yes, in mockery, but he was coronated under the leadership of the highest authority in the land, Pilate, the governor of Judea. And so we see the, a, a particular insight of God just saying, I'm declaring my king. But now when Pilate was getting nowhere, we read that, but instead an uproar was starting, he took a water and washed his hands in front of the crowd. Now, this was amazing. I mean, he said, I don't have nothing to do. So he took his hands and washed them in front of them. And he says, it, it is you who want to crucify him, not I. Look, you do it. And then he said, I am innocent of this man's blood. Wow. Now, just think about it. Where else did the washing of hands take place on Passover? But remember one of the first Passover. So we talked about in, uh, in Exodus that they were commanded that, that, to bring in on Nisan 10, to bring in the lamb, the one-year-old spotted unblemished lamb, spotless, unblemished lamb. And they bring him into the house for four days. I talked about in that part one. And then at the fourth day on Nisan 14, the father would take that beloved lamb that the children had bonded to, and then he would uh, sacrifice it, kill it, take the blood and put it on the doorposts and the top posts and the side posts. And, but the father would do something because he knew the children were upset. He knew that they, there was, it was horrific what they're watching. And he would wash his hands. And what would the father say? The father, when he would take that little lamb in front of the children, he said, I am innocent of this lamb's blood. It's very similar to Pilate saying, I am innocent of this man's blood, who was Jesus, the lamb of God. Wow, wow, we, whoa. You see God just fulfilling again and again. Then they took Jesus and they, and he was bearing the cross, went out to a place of the skull, which is in Hebrew called Golgotha, where they crucified him and two others with him, one on the one side and Jesus in the center. And they put a sign up, they put a title over the cross and the writing was Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. That's what it says in John 19, 19. Now, to be exact, it says Jesus, the Nazarene, and the King of the Jews. Now, I want to just show you something here that might you might miss, and it's not a major point, but it is an interesting point. And it says, then many of the Jews read this title, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And it was written in three languages. What? Hebrew, Greek, in Latin. Now, when you ever see uh, uh, the crucifix in a Catholic church, <coughs> you'll see it has a little sign above it, and it's I-N-R-I. Now, you may have been confused or 
question, why INRI? Well, because it's from the Latin. INRI stands for Jesus Nazarene, Rex is king of the Jews. And so it's a uh, INRI is an acronym for that. Now, if I were to take that an acronym, and of course that's from a Catholic perspective, but if I were to take that and do it from a Jewish perspective, I would take it and I would have this. I would have Yeshua HaNazarene Vemelech HaYehudim, which is Jesus the Nazarene and king of the Jews. And if I put that in the Hebrew letters, and of course they go from right to left, opposite what we do in English, and when I take the first letter of each one, which one, which, what do I get? I get Y-H-W-H, which is yud heh vav -Heh, which is the unspeakable name of Yahweh. Now, some would just uh, say this is not really quite, quite valid because you're using uh, just the the beginning of each letter, the thes and, and and, but it is a hidden Yahweh that was over the cross. Certainly it, up, it caused a great uproar amongst the priests and their chief priests uh, came to Pilate and said, do not write the king of the Jews, but he said, I am the king of the Jews. And Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written, praise the Lord. But we have the Lamb of God, Jesus. And then we go and we see that he was taken to the cross. And it says that he was put on the cross. And then from the sixth hour until the ninth hour. What time was that? 12 noon till 3 o'clock. And it says, and there was darkness in the land. Have you ever seen ever three hours of complete darkness right at noon hour? I have never. It was a miracle. It was amazing sign. And it says about the ninth hour. So it would be just about 3 o'clock. Uh, just before 3 o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of those who stood there, when they heard this, they said, this man is calling out for Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with sour wine and put uh, on a reed and offered it to him to drink. And the rest said, let him alone. Let us see if Elijah will come and save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded his spirit. Now the Gospel of John adds something, and it gives a little bit, and Jesus did yield up his spirit, but in the Gospel of John, in John 19, verse 30, it says, Now a vessel of sour wine was sitting there. They filled it with a sponge and sour wine, and they put it on hyssop, and they put it to his mouth. And when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is is finished also means it is completed and bowing his head he gave up his spirit and so jesus died now what was happening on the uh, temple mount at this exact same time i just want to just take a moment and explain to you that perhaps something that you may have totally missed and when you read into the uh, talmud you read about what was happening there on Passover. On Passover day, Nisan 14, in the day itself, they moved things around a bit because they had to sacrifice all the lambs before a certain time. And so they moved the morning, they, sorry, the afternoon offering and the offer, uh, afternoon prayers from three o'clock to one o'clock so that all the lambs, all the lambs, and Josephus says at the time of Jesus, there was 256,000 lambs sacrificed. Now, whether that's a right number or a correct number, we don't know for sure, but he, he said 250, that meant 256,000 families there in Jerusalem because this is one of the three times of the year where all the families had, all the men had to come and they would gather for the feast. But so the lambs, all the lambs that were, and all of the lambs remembered from last week, uh, the last session I did, that all the lambs were taken from Bethlehem, 
They had to come from the shepherd's field. They brought them in and they were sacrificed, but they had to be all be completed at three o'clock. And at three o'clock, and they were really pre precise about this, at three o'clock, what would happen was a high priest would sacrifice the last of the lamb. Some say actually that the high priest would sacrifice his lamb last. We're not positive of that, but we does say that the last of the lambs had to be completed and that high priest would then shout out in a loud voice, it is finished, it is completed. And the shofars would begin to blow. The, the priests go to the edge and blow the shofars. Everybody in the land know that all the lambs had been sacrificed. They could come now, pick up their lambs to roast, and they had to roast them before the next day, which was a high Sabbath, which was unleavened bread. So they had to do it before sunset. And But what was happening on the Temple Mount? Well, at that very, very hour, of course, we knew that when on the Temple Mount itself, um, when he was, everything was blowing, we see that Jesus, on him, he died on the cross. Now, some would say, "We are you sure about that blowing of the trumpets and everything else? Well, just in the recent years, they have found up near the Temple Mount uh, a piece of the, the uh, stone, and on it is written this, to the place of trumpeting to. So not the full sentence, but it, it indicates that trumpeting, blowing of the shofars took place. And it is believed that that would have been on, taking place on Nisan 14 on Passover. So Jesus was on the cross. There were three of them. And it says, then behold, the veil of the temple was torn from top to bottom. Wow. You know, that was a sign for us, you know. What was happening here? The temple veil torn from top to bottom, meaning indicating only God could have done it. This veil was uh, of great length, of great weight, and for anyone to tear it in human strength, impossible. But God tore it down. Now, for us as believers in Yeshua, in Jesus, we know that this opened the way for us to come into communion with God himself because only the high priest could come in once a year and go beyond the veil but now this veil is torn open but something we also may often miss is that that same there was something that took place when a father would lose his first son when his first son would be would died or, or was killed the father in grief would take his robe and from the top bottom he would tear it open and could this be also what God was indicating, he, the father, his first son, has given his life. And then it said, the earth quaked. Oh my goodness, could you imagine being there in darkness on, the, uh, on Golgotha? And the earth is quaking, and the rocks were split, and graves were opened, it reports. And let me just go back and finish that. And many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the graves after the resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. Now this was after the resurrection that they appeared. But on Golgotha on that day, they were just in panic. They were uh, running. There was a cracking of splitting uh, with all around and the buildings around. And many, many would say, had to say, what in the world is happening? Well, of course, now we know the next day after Nisan 14 is it begins the seven day period called unleavened bread. Unleavened always means no sin. And so Jesus went into the grave without sin before, just before the unleavened bread began, which began, of course, at sunset on Nisan 14, and then Nisan 15 began. And there, and it, we actually read this in John 19, 31. We often miss this one in, uh, from a Western point of view. And therefore, because it was preparation day that the body should be remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for the Sabbath was a high day. And that was the, the first day of unleavened bread. It's a high Sabbath. And the last day was a high Sabbath as well. And the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Now, why is this important? Well, because some people have said, you know, that 
Jesus probably died on a Thursday, not a Friday. Now, tradition has it set by Constantine centuries later that it was Friday that he died and then he rose on Sunday. But in actual fact, there is a scripture here um, in Matthew 12, verse 40, where Jesus himself said, For as Jonah was in three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Now you cannot get three days and three nights when you go from Friday to Sunday. And so some would say, yes, he probably died on Thursday. That would give the three days and the three nights, and they had to get him in the grave, uh, get, have him buried, because the, 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 as Passover ended, the next day was a high Sabbath which it indicated in the Gospel of John. So that perhaps is it. Now, one other question some of them say, well, it says um, uh, uh, the third day Jesus rose from the dead. In actual fact, the little preposition there can mean after the third day. So even that has been taken care of. Just a thought, tradition, no rules, and we will continue to be celebrating the Christian year from Friday, his death, and Sunday his resurrection but it very interesting the first fruits you remember I said the first fruit fell on the day after the Sabbath the Shabbat and we read here something else happened for the high priest and the Lord spoke to Moses this is going back to Leviticus this is a command way back centuries centuries before Speak to the children of Israel and say, When you come into the land which I give you and reap its harvest, then you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruit of your harvest to the priest. And he will wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted on your behalf. On that day, that day after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. So notice what is happening here. It was going right into the... Uh, that, that day of the Sabbath, uh, following the Sabbath, the priest, the high priest, would take a sheaf of barley and would wave it in, as a sign of the first fruits. Now, the Talmud actually records that the high priest planted, in preparation for this, barley on the Mount of Olives. He would cut his sheaf of, uh, of uh, the barley and he would wave it before uh, on the Mount of Olives before the Lord as a sign of the first fruits, fulfilling this command. But he would also do one other thing. He would call forth for the Messiah to come forth on that day. That's what the Talmud records. Who would have done that in the day of Jesus? It would have been Caiaphas, the evil Caiaphas who had him killed, would wave the sheaf of barley and say, come, Messiah, come. Now, was Jesus, by the way, this is, he was supposed to wave it uh, as a sign of the first fruits uh, for the, the barley offering. And uh, who was the first fruits? Well, we read about that from uh, Paul in 1 Corinthians. He says, but now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of all those who have fallen asleep. See, Jesus became the first fruits by his death so that we could bring forth us who follow. For since by man came death, by man also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. But each one in his own order. Look at the next part. Christ the first fruits. Afterwards, those who are Christ at his coming. So, Again, uh, Christ is the first fruits and he was called forth. Now, one last thing just before I close off. And I just want to bring this forward. We're talking now the resurrection. And there's something that was very different in John's gospel. And it talked about Jesus, yes, being laid there. And then he rose from the dead. And then the disciples came. And Simon Peter came following and went into the tomb. And he saw, and listen to this, the linen cloths lying there. And the handkerchief that had been around his neck, his head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded together in a place by itself. You say, why would this be included? Why would John include this? So the 
the, the cloth that was around the head, the handkerchief, um, was not with the other part that was folded there. And actually the, the handkerchief uh, was folded together in a place by itself. So what's this all about? Well, let me just take for a moment, <clears throat> and I know there's some talk about, you know, that uh, perhaps this was a sign, you know, that Jesus was eating the meals and he was not finished yet. And the custom was that uh, you folded your handkerchief and then saying to the servants, uh, look, I'm not finished, I'm coming back. And but that's really, I can't find that in Jewish history. I can find it in some medieval history. But I did find something that just happened recently uh, in the last years where they found in northern Galilee, they found about a tecton. They found tectons. You say, what's a tecton? Well, a tecton is a person who works in wood and who works in uh, stone. And uh, in, a, in a larger cities, they would have people who did these separately, but in the smaller towns and villages like Nazareth, the tecton would work in wood and work in stone to build, for example, a cart. Now, was Jesus a tecton? Well, absolutely he was. Look at Mark 6, verse 3. And they questioned uh, Jesus when he was in his ministry. And they said, is this not the carpenter? But the word is tecton. Tecton, and the son of Mary, and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon, and are you not his sisters here with us? So they were offended at him. Now you say, why is this important? Well, let me just close off, and I want to just say as we I, that whole area about Jesus being a tecton because what we found in the nazareth is that there was something that took place that was very very special and what took place was that <clears throat> uh, they in found in uh, recently in in the excavations they found texts saying what they would do the practice they had one of the practices of tecton would be when they would be commissioned to do say like a cart and so there's stonework and there's woodwork and the uh, the money would be given and of course it took time to do it and sometimes a person lived ways away miles away maybe even days away and they had a, a a signal if you will so when the tecton had finished what he was doing in case that he might miss the person who's coming from afar to uh, come and get what he had purchased the tecton had an arrangement that he would take off his head covering, which would be sweaty from working and making the cart, for example. And he would fold it up and he would put it beside the cart. Now that was a signal to the person who had purchased it that they could come and they could pick it up because it was completed. But the signal was this. This is what it's written. When he took his uh, head uh, dress his, his his handkerchief the covering the head covering and fold it what he was saying here's the signal work completed done to perfection wow wow well we will that's maybe what the disciples saw when they saw that the linen cloths were live separate from the headdress folded work completed done to perfection Wa wa we wo. Amen and amen.